right. Praise God. Jesus bless this message in Jesus name. I pray. Amen. Okay, guys, now you're going to take notes on this and you're going to have to pause your video and follow along with me on this one so that you clearly understand. And I'll be going through it a lot the rest of this week. Okay. Now you're going to turn, we're going to talk about the two seeds of Genesis 315. Right there. Okay, so go ahead and turn to Genesis 3.15. Hold on a minute. Let me get our... Because, I'm going to tell you in a minute, 3.15. Is this God talking to the devil? And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, and that's what we're going to start out talking about today. I want you to take notes, okay? And there's one thing I think we can all agree on today is Jesus said when he returns, it'll be a repeat of the days of Noah, a repeat of the days of Noah. Everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of things to come in the new. Okay? So I think that we can all agree that we're now seeing as it were in the days of Noah. Right now today. Demonologies open the door by modern spiritualism. You know, our poor old earth is experiencing the days of Noah right now today. You're watching manifestations happen everywhere. You're watching them all over television, you're hearing it all in your music, this, this uh, secular music, you're seeing it live in your face in the Grammys, live in your face in the Super Bowl, you're seeing it in your, in your webcams, people taking pictures and seeing stuff out, in the, you know what I'm saying, they're manifesting everywhere, y'all, so we are in the days of Noah, as it were in the days of Noah, today, okay, so we're going to look at the birth well, we're going to talk about these two seeds right here. Let's go ahead before I say any more. Here's your questions I want to ask you right there. You can put it in the comment section. Just label it one, two, three, and four. Number one, who is the seed of Satan? Number two, who is the seed of the woman? Number three, what is Nephilim? What does that mean? And number four, what is the only weapon Satan has to hurt God? You copy those down right there. Sorry about the light. I'm trying to move this over here. There you go. Best I can do. Okay, so we're gonna you're gonna uh we're gonna talk about that. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to understand the ultimate prophecy of Genesis 3:15, as you see it, details two seeds. Who will be at war or have enmity, in other words, with each other. The seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. Okay, and by the time I'm done, maybe you understand, you can be able to answer that right there in the comments section. Okay, so I want you to take a look. Where's my marker? I want you to read Galatians 3.16. I'll write it right here. Read, I'll put read, Galatians 3.16, what else I got, um, John 7.42, and 1 John 3.9. Let's see if you can see that. Yeah, you can see it. Okay, I want you to read those two. And you're going to let scripture interpret scripture. I want you to explain the meaning of thy seed that you read in Genesis 3.15. Explain the meaning of 
thy seed. In Genesis 3.15. That's what I want you to do. And, and, you, and you write this down in your notebook because we're going to talk about it. We may talk about it a little bit Friday night and Saturday night at the barn. So just hold your note. I want you to answer one through four in the comments section. Answer that in the comments section. Anything below this line right here, you answer it in your note, in your study notebook and bring this to class. I'll put bring to barn. You don't have to answer this part in the video. Just one through four. That's all. Everything else you're going to bring to the barn. But I want you to write that out and bring that to the barn. I want you to read Galatians 3.16, John 7.42, and 1 John 3.9. And I want you to write out in your study notebook, explain the meaning of thy seed that Genesis 3.15 is talking about. And I want you to do this. Why would, number, put this number one. Number two. Why would Satan... Have such a seed. Why would Satan even have such a seed in the first place? Okay. Let you know, uh, Second Thessalonians two, three through four. Let's read that real quick. Second Thessalonians two, three through four. Give me a second to get there. Turn right to it. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You can look up more scriptures to see what did Jesus say the temple is. What is the temple in the first place? Okay, but we're not going to go there just yet. So again, one through four in the comments section on the video. Underneath that line, bring it to Clap. Bring it to the barn. Don't answer the rest of this in the video, please. Bring it to the barn. Read Galatians 3.16, John 7.42, 1 John 3.9. And I want you to write out and bring it to the barn. Explain the meaning of thy seed in Genesis 3.15 in the first place. And why would Satan have this kind of seed? Okay. I think you can see that. All right. The Antichrist. Who is, who is 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4 talking about? The man of sin. Talking about the Antichrist. He will be the man of sin and yet the son of perdition at the same time. Literally, the seed of the serpent. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ was the son of man and the son of God in one person. Remember, God is superposition. He could be here and there and there and there at the same time, man. We can't do that. But he does and he, he can and he does. Let me back this up some. You can get all that in there. Go ahead and write that down. Okay. Uh, so this is the only logical conclusion that I come up with is if her seed ultimates in a single personality, if her seed, I'm talking about, let me move this over here. Sorry about the shadow. It says her seed. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, if her seed is talking about a single personality, which is Jesus Christ, a literal personality, a literal person, then by every principle, the sound of sound interpretation, thy seed, because he also says her seed and thy seed. It's 
two seeds here, ma'am. Two different seeds. Slow it down and read it again. Then thy seed is also talking about a single person. A person, which is who? The Antichrist. Been here a long time, y'all. I'm going to show you later how he's been here through Nimrod, Pharaoh, Judas Iscariot, and he's, he's coming through another person. Everything that's been will be there ain't nothing new under the sun. Everything that's going on now is a repeat of the days of Noah, okay? Her seed is Jesus Christ. Thy seed, God is talking to, is the Antichrist. It birthed the Antichrist. Okay, so as hard as it might be to fathom, God, in Genesis 3.15, he clearly points to the revealing of two children, the Messiah and the seed of the devil. The Messiah and the devil's seed. Two different seeds. You got that? Two children here he's revealing. Okay, so with near universal consensus, you know, you got Bible scholars, theologians, pastors, everybody pretty much agrees, the church basically, agrees that the seed of the woman refers to a literal person, a person, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the seed of a woman. Pay attention. In other words, this ain't no metaphor. This ain't no illusion. Conversely, thy seed in this passage and the seed of the serpent, that seed, thy seed right here, and the seed of the serpent must also be a person, a literal person. You understand? It's not just about a system. It's a person. Offspring, the Antichrist, the offspring of thy seed. Talking about Satan is thy seed. Her seed is the woman. Thy seed, he's talking to the devil. So, in Galatians 3.16, we're told that the seed of Abraham, to whom the covenant promises of God would pass on, was to... The Lord Jesus Christ. In John 7, 42, we read that Christ cometh of the seed of David. Um, and, and as a born-again believers, all, every single Christian, we are a seed as well. You understand? Because, 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So in all instances, seed, that word seed refers to a birth of a child. You understand? The literal birth of a child. Let me move this over here. Can you see that pretty good? Okay, let me fix this. I'm sorry, y'all. Trying to get this straight. There you go. So it's a little seed. Uh, just like it's and it's confirmed right there in Genesis 3:15. It's confirmed in 1 John 3:9. It's confirmed in John 7, 42, and it's confirmed in Galatians 3, 16. The devil's motive, y'all, in having uh, his own offspring, what do you think that is? What is his motive in having his own offspring? Everything I ask you from this point is in your study notebook for the barn, okay? What do you think the devil's motive is for having his own offspring. There, there's a couple reasons, but what's the main motive? 
the main motive. Because we know he's the ultimate imitator of God, right? He wants to imitate God as, as uh, when he said in Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. And I'm telling you something, nothing will bring him closer to imitating the Lord than the Antichrist. A demonic uh, mimicry of the birth of the Mashiach, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Okay, I want you to read Galatians 6, 1 through 4. Let me right over here. Took my shoes off. Ooh, the floor is cold. Hold on, y'all. In the basement with the cement floor freezing. When I say Galatians 6, 1 through 4, read Galatians 6, 1 through 4. One through four. Let me fix that. And you're going to read Matthew chapter 24. What I got? Verses 38 and 39. Oops. I keep doing that. 38 through 39. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what to do with that. You're going to go ahead and read Galatians 6, 1 through 4, and Matthew 24, 38 and 39. And I want you to examine those passages really good. Who is Jesus? Here's my question to you. Who is Jesus referring to when he says, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage. I want you to take your study notebooks for the barn and explain your reasoning with biblical evidence. Explain your reasoning with biblical evidence. Who was Jesus referring to here? They were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage. Just everyday people. Because if God destroys the world, y'all, for everyday people that he created, drinking and marrying, then, then, then hey, we didn't stand a chance from the get-go. Who is he referring to there? Write that in your study notebook and bring that to the barn. Okay. And now I want you to uh, tell me, look, read uh, Genesis 6. You're going to go to Genesis 6-4. That's one thing I want you to do right there. You're going to go, you can also read Genesis 6, 4. And you're going to go to Job. You're going to read chapter 1, 2, and 38. Chapter. Let's see if you can see that. Yep. This is number one thing right over here. Now, so I got one, two. This would be number three. This would be number four for the barn. And if you're not coming to the barn, you do it on your own. You're going to read Genesis. I mean, you're going to read uh, what I said. Yeah, Genesis 6, 4 and Job chapters 1, 2, and 38. What are two ways that we can confirm the meaning of sons of God? Right here, read them. Sons of God. Two ways. Let me move over here. To confirm that meaning. It's right here. Write that question down. As you see, I'm starting to run out of room on the board. So pay close, 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 close attention, you guys. Okay. Now turn to 1 John 3, 2. This is stuff you can do later, but give me a minute to get to 1 John. Oops. 1 John 
Three, two. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you, what are two motives? You think we're hard. What are two motives Satan had in inciting the Genesis 6 invasions? Because you're going to have to read Genesis chapter 6 to understand. Well, you know what? Let me back up. This is some study now. I want you to read Genesis chapter 6. Let's go there right now. Let's read through some of it. God was already warning Satan of what was yet to come. And it happened in Genesis 6. Here we go. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God there's two groups of people here. Pay attention. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took why they took wives for themselves, all of whom they chose. The Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. After what? The flood. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every, every intent of their thoughts and of his heart was evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I'm going to destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I'm sorry I made them. But Noah, Noah, it's one person, y'all, one person, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, not Noah's wife. Not Noah's children, Noah. But because Noah's family accepted the Lord, grace was shown to them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You're going to go on and read on through that. You're going to see that Noah was the only one righteous of his generation. Noah, only one, righteous, pure. Pure. This is going to your DNA, y'all. DNA, the tainted. The, the taintedness happened to everybody, man, back then. And this is what I'm going to with this, and we'll get there eventually. This is why there's a need for being reborn, being sanctified, cleansed, purified, walking in God's word and letting his word walk in you. You living it, man, you abiding in it. This is the need for a blood sacrifice in the first place because God created you with his DNA in you and Satan came and tainted the human being's DNA. Do you understand that? That's the need for salvation in the first place. That's why blood is now involved in a sacrifice because your blood is tainted. Tainted. So it's blood for blood. You got to be purified, cleansed, reborn, washed, made anew, turned back upright, turned back upright. And I'm not going to get too deep into this, but there's a twin system, okay, that most people understand. You're, there's a down and an up. And I'll tell you something. The fallen understand this very much. They put it out there on commercials, on TV. They put it in movies where you'll see one down, one up, uh, all that stuff, man. So you have to be turned back up right. That's why Jesus came to turn you, give you the choice 
to turn back upright. And then he tells you, you better abide in it because you can certainly fall back to your old DNA line that's in you. So you keep yourself pure of God. He said, be, God said, be holy. That's something you got to allow to happen. You want to be holy? Then you got to walk in holiness. You got to abide in God's word and let his word abide in you. Okay. So going back to Genesis 3.15, in light of the ultimate prophecy of Genesis 3.15, what, what do you think the importance of the birth of Cain was? What was the importance about the birth of Cain in light of Genesis 3.15? Write that down. Bring it to the barn. Okay. Two times in scripture, Jesus prophesied that the end times, the final years before his return to earth, as it tells you in Revelation, would be a repetition of the times of Noah. A repetition, a repeat of the times of Noah. So what, what made the antediluvian age so unique that the Savior pointed to the days of Noah as a preview of, of what the end of the world would look like? Think about that. The ancient epic witnessed the fallen angels. This, and again, who is the fallen angels, y'all? Better yet, who are the sons of God? The fallen angels, the sons of God, Genesis 6, 4. They contaminated the human race genetically and spiritually. How? By fornication. They did what? They contaminated the human race genetically and spiritually via fornication. They, the word they, 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 they were eating. They were drinking and marrying human women until the flood swept them away in a judgment of God so severe that only eight humans survived. The term, where's my marker? Hold up. You'll see the term. Oh, my picture fell. Hold on, y'all. Hold on a second. I'm not redoing this video. The term sons of God. You can see that. Yes, you can. There's a Hebrew word. Called Benai Ha Elohim. In Genesis 6 2, that exclusively refers to angels in the Old Testament. And we see a confirmation of this in the book of Job. So you're going to go to Job 1 6 through 7. You're going to look for confirmation. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, the Benai Ha Elohim, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where you come from? Satan answered the Lord, said, I'm going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Okay, this is so, that's angels, angels, sons of God, right there, you just see it, the Benai Ha Elohim, angels, the sons of God, if you got that understood, are angels, okay, so in this heavenly context, we find the sons of God in heaven speaking with the Lord before his throne. Speaking with the Lord. And the devil is with them. Okay? So the clear context 
it informs us that these are angelic beings in conference with the creator. Amen. And Job chapter 2 provides a similar divine counsel in which the sons of God once again gather themselves before God and Satan is again with them. Job chapter 2. Okay. The third confirmation in the book of Job is found in chapter 38. Four through seven. You look at specifically Job 38, four through seven. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who is who hath laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? He's saying, since you know so much. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God, the, ben, the Benai Elohim, shouted for joy. So the sons of God stand before the throne of the Lord in heaven. They rejoiced at the creation of the earth, predating Adam and Eve. They rejoiced at the creation of the earth. And they were lured into the sin of fornication. Entering the human realm, okay, and, and taking human women as wives and giving birth to their offspring, Nephilim, the giants, the renowned men of old. And this was a direct response to the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, when Yahweh announced that the seed of the woman, a human messiah, would be born one day and bruise, because that's what he uses, the word bruise or crush the head of the serpent, defeating the adversary and redeeming humanity. Do you understand Jesus came to redeem you? What does that mean? Just Did he come just to save you? No, baby, he came to redeem you. That means take you back, take back what belongs to him. He came to redeem humanity. And from this, I want you to write it down. What does that word redeem mean? Bring it to the barn. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, redeem. What does that mean? What did Jesus come to do? Did he come to save you or redeem you? He came to take back what belongs to him. That's what he did. From that moment on, the devil focused, y'all. He focused his sights on preventing the birth or uh, of corrupting this child. His focus was on destroying or stopping the birth of this child, Jesus. That was his main focus. And this was the motivation for corrupting Cain. In the first place, the first child of Adam and Eve, from the fallen angel perspective, Cain could have been the Messiah from their perspective. He was, after all, the seed of Eve, right? So the devil didn't know if this was the Messiah or not. So he went straight on head and heels to corrupt that child right off the get-go. Because he knows God told him, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. And he knows he didn't father that child, Cain. He didn't know if it was the Messiah or not. So he went straight for him, right? Satan succeeded, man, in luring Cain into sinful rebellion, and removing one potential threat to his reign. That's what he did with Cain. Do you understand? So with the older brother corrupted and effectively out of the picture, you know, maybe his younger twin Abel was the Messiah. To the devil. That's what Satan's thinking, huh? So by corrupting Cain so effectively that he murdered his own brother in spite of in, in spite and jealousy and all that, Satan was in effect killing two threats with one deception. You understand? Okay, so the Lord punished Cain 
by banishing him from Eden, right? A move that allowed the bloodline that leads to the Messiah to grow and flourish in safety through Seth. Seth was who? The third son of Adam and Eve, right? So with the human population and number of quote unquote potential messiahs increasing exponentially, right? The enemy needed a large scale attack on the human race. Do you understand? And that, that right there was the setting for the Genesis chapter six incursion. Introducing fallen angel DNA into humanity. Mankind would be corrupted mutating into something other than the image bearers of God, other than, because God created us in his image. So he tainted that. The contamination of human genetics was so disastrous that only Noah was the only one that wasn't tainted. The only one, only one. Read the Bible yourself, only one. And the rest of his family members were spared in that final judgment because why? God showed his grace. God's very graceful, merciful God. If you choose God, he'll help you. If you choose God, he'll save you. But you can't, you can't go against the word of God that Noah was the only one righteous, pure of his generation. That's the word of God. Okay. Now, if you take a look at Luke 20, 16 through 21, I'm running out of room on the board. You have to pause your video and write this down. In Luke 20, 16 through 21, what was the significance of Jesus closing the book in the first place? Examining the, re the remainder of the prophecy what was its importance in relation to Israel? You're going to have to look at Isaiah 61, 2 through 3 for that. Okay. And I also want you to tell me, you're going to have to look at, I'll write these down, Isaiah 62, 1 through 4. Isaiah 62, 11 through 12. And Luke 13, 34 through 35. Now you answer me this, what could Satan achieve by destroying or corrupting the nation of Israel? What could he achieve by destroying Israel that he's been trying to do since the beginning of time? What could he achieve from doing that by corrupting or destroying the nation of Israel? What could he achieve? Think about that. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. If I'm saying that right, Esaias, I can't pronounce it. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and he went and sat down. And they played this out for us when we was in Israel a few months back. And all the eyes of everybody that, that was at his first advent, all the eyes of all them that were in his first advent, the Lord Jesus Christ took on himself human flesh and he became the Lamb of God, the suffering servant, y'all, who would give his life as a ransom for many do you understand that? Matthew 20, 28. His sacrifice on the cross, y'all, was the atonement for the sins of anybody who believes in him. This is what Jesus referred to in Luke 
4, 16 through 21 that I just read out to you. He read the scripture. He said, and many began to say to him, this day, this script, this scripture, I'm sorry. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. But I want you to take notice that Jesus closed the book. He closed the book. Pay attention now. When you dissect, look for everything. He closed the book before he finished the verse. And here's the rest of it. Isaiah 61, 2 through 3. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So this had some immense prophetic importance right here. God would exact vengeance on Satan, the fallen angels, and anybody else who oppose him at his second coming. That's when he'll do it. Okay? This is why the Lord closed the book. As this judgment is not going to take place until his second advent. Do you understand? And more, the prophecy from Isaiah connected the final judgment of the devil to the redemption of Israel. Where Yeshua, the Messiah, will give Israel beauty for ashes. His salvation and love for their repentance. Okay, And I did that study on here for you last week. Romans chapter 11, where I explained to you the two trees, the wild olive tree and the original olive tree. And if you accept Jesus Christ, you're broken off that wild tree and you grafted into the original olive tree. But he has closed the eyes temporarily to those people. And he will open their eyes. And many of them will get grafted back onto the original tree. You gotta go back and watch that. Time and time again. In the Old Testament, God prophesied a redemption of Israel linked to his return to the earth. And again, giving Satan advance notice of his impending defeat. Satan knows this is coming, y'all. He knows this is coming. That's why he's been trying to stop Jesus every way he can, even by corrupting the human DNA, because we are created in God's image. Do you understand? Having failed in the first half of the prophecy, he, he failed because he did not prevent the birth of the Messiah. The devil then turned his sights to the second half, trying to destroy Israel outright, preventing, uh, trying to prevent its redemption. Or he's trying to corrupt it beyond repair. He's still trying to stop Jesus from coming back. This is a critical part of the devil's end times mechanisms to, to prove God wrong before the heavenly host and, and, and let a divine prophecy fall. That's what he wants. Corrupting or destroying Israel would provide Satan proof that a prophecy of God failed, wouldn't it? And it could also delay the return of, of Jesus Christ to the earth. The scripture identifies Israel's repentance as a precursor of the second coming. Isaiah 62, 11 through 12. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed. What's that word mean? The redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought after, a city not forsaken. And look at Matthew 23, 39. For I say unto you, you shall not see me anymore, henceforth, from here on out, until you say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So Jesus told the Israelites that his return was predicted upon their acknowledging him as Savior. He ain't going to come back and return, y'all, until he opens their eyes and gives them a chance 
to come back to him, to come to him. So, in the end times, Satan going to unleash a strong delusion. We're in those times right now. Right now. He's going to unleash a strong delusion, the Antichrist, who's going to deceive Israel and most of the world, man, into believing that he is the true Mashiach. Do you understand that? The Antichrist, who is the final Nephilim, will have a satanic obsession, an obsession with corrupting and destroying Israel. Do you understand? Ezekiel 37, 21 and, 30, uh, 21 and 25. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them evermore. God is that sanctuary. The reconciliation of Israel to the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the most critical aspects of end time scripture. Amen. So there's a lot of places in the Old Testament prophecy that Yeshua, he rests his second advent upon Israel's restoration. And you guys that come to the barn, you're seeing God live in action right there with one of Israel's people right now. Avi, you're seeing God live in action with me. That's my bloodline. Israel. God's opened my eyes using me. You're watching him bring IV in, getting ready to bust his eyes open, y'all. God is doing that. Despite their rampant adultery, their pride, their wickedness, all that, God in love still promised that they would one day return to their land, which they have, and he will dwell with them. And the beauty of this is that everybody, all who believe in Jesus Christ, are in Israel. Are Israel. Are Israel. We are Israel. We are Israel. And I showed you this in Romans chapter 11. Go watch the video. You are Israel. In your own sin and your own shortcomings, you got to know that God is patiently ready to forgive you and he'll restore you too. Okay? So that's enough for today. I gave y'all quite much. But take it to understand these two seeds. That's what I want you to do. All right? I'm going to stop right there because I can keep going, man, and really suck, really load y'all up with some stuff. But I don't want to overload you. But understand the two seeds. Understand that right there. That one is the seed, the seed of God. I mean, God and a woman birthed Jesus Christ and Satan, who is an angel, a divine being, angel, and a woman. What did he birth the, what did he birth the Antichrist for in the first place? What was he trying to do? Go back and answer the question, y'all. All right. I want to thank some of you so much for what you've done for the ministry. Thank those of you that's helping us. If anything you need for that's in the description on the videos. You have to look in the description box. There's also tells you how to do it on JesusDoers.com. You can get Igor's World News on the World Tab section on JesusDoers.com. You can get your witnessing shirt. I think you can get your... Um, 24 years shelf life survival food on there too by my patriot um you can see what we're doing in africa there um also on our website jesusdoers.com you'll see a qr code thing um that it's the king james version of no matter what your language is it's in you click on that and if you speak chinese it'll give you the king james in chinese for free if you speak japanese it'll be in japanese for free if you speak i don't know Tahiti, whatever. It'll be every single language for your uh, King James Bible is right there available if you don't have one. There you go. Okay. That's on the front page. All right. So do that, y'all. Bring it to the barn. But either way, on YouTube, you guys answer one through four on YouTube in the comment section. Okay. There you go. God bless you all. Make Jesus Lord of your life. And we will get into this even further because we're in those days right now a repeat of the days of noah right now all right god bless you all